neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction, except as a punishment, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except, except, except. Except the 13th Amendment had a big exception which has put us in this unjust direction. Slavery is now by another name. Incarceration is now the Jim Crow game. If you speak up and out, you can be in prison too. If you speak up and out, FBI will find something to put on you. Oh, Mr. President, Mr. President, could you just do one thing? Pardon some of your people from the government, private prison, and county crime ring. Mr. President, Mr. President, could you just do one thing? Free the political prisoners, free the black women, and let them be heard. Join us to raise up bold new perspectives on racial justice through dialogue, media analysis, and a call to action. We can go beyond the usual pardon and make substantial changes in the lives of individuals who fought for us, are fighting with us now, and those who have been forgotten. December 8th from 12 to 1.30 p.m., Institute for Policy Studies with Lashonia Thompson L., Stuart Anderson, Darubin Ben Wahad, Danny Glover, and Karen Dole. I, I want to certainly want to thank IPS and I want to thank every single one who's on the panel here, Daruba, and, and every single person who is a part of, of uh, this discourse today. Um, I, my, my experience uh, with, with mass incarceration hasn't been personal from the vantage point because I've been arrested, but it's usually for things that I, I, I protest against, you know, with the student uh, activists and, and uh, a strike at San Francisco State in 1968. Uh, and, and virtually that period from various points on, whether it's been uh, in defense of uh, and the fight for justice and the end of apartheid. And, and, but I, I would say the work that around mass incarceration that I've been privileged to do, and I say privileged because I've been there and met some incredible and amazing people from both Taylor and Unity One in, uh, in LA to my, my brother, uh, um, Nani Alejandres, who has brought in the in in, in, um, in Santa Cruz. So I've, I've, I've visited uh, on, on numerous occasions uh, with Harry Belfani, Connie Rice, who has been very much involved in, in the, the, uh, the mass incarceration, uh, uh, places like Soledad, Vacaville, Tracy, uh, San Quentin, and other places in, in California. Uh, and, and support those efforts who, who of, of men and women who've, uh, um, who've worked on, on programs of reentry, who worked in trying to shape a relationship between men and women who are incarcerated, connecting, continue to connect them with the communities in which they come from and not have them isolated from the communities. I've watched some of, <clears throat> I've been privy privy to some remarkable moments within that 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 period uh, within those those the work that these men and women do you know from 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 sessions circles of, for life in San Quentin where lifers were were talking to and speaking with with young people who were about to re-entry uh, to be re-entered into uh, into uh, the communities their community and and nurturing them men putting them and so forth. So I've been privy to that. I, I specifically, specifically <clears throat> have, have been able to, to embrace um, um, some of the issues, the issues around political prisoners. Um, I come from a, a moment in time where several pairs of, of, of mine, people that I've been close to have been political prisoners, you know, um, and who um, um, who spent long periods of time uh, in in jail, uh, incarcerated uh, from from members of the um, uh, the Panther Eight who were just uh, uh, who 
were uh, retried for, for, for supposedly crimes of uh, murder of a policeman in San Francisco in 1972. And, uh, and, and, and I had the opportunity to, to be at a conference of incarcerated uh, men and women in Oakland, California most recently. And I, I, I met brothers and, and brothers who had been incarcerated and were released and had been incarcerated for, for 40, 45 years, 47 years. And the one thing that moved me so much about their commit was their commitment to work on behalf of those others who were incarcerated to get them free, to get them free. And certainly we, we look at the last now 45 days or so of the Obama administration and how do we begin to extend this conversation and dialogue to perhaps in, 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 to perhaps have, have a platform which we can free those uh, those 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 men and women who are incarcerated. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Karen. Okay, I'm not sure I can keep Facebook Live going <laughs> while I also hold it. But um, you want me to? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Danny. It's such an honor to be on this panel with people who've really been in the trenches. I'm truly in a privileged uh, place. And that, that camera's too close to my hey. middle-aged face. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I have statistics. and But I have some stories, too, I, in the way that Lashanya works with um, children who have incarcerated parents. Last year, I spent about eight months uh, listening to parents who have incarcerated children. And... Uh, to me, the, the great evil that is uh, encaging our youth, overwhelmingly black, brown, LGBTQI+, uh, and poor children, uh, is, is, is just an unforgivable blight on a system that pretends to be a free and democratic country. Mm -hmm. certainly is not. And the cradle to to death pipeline, really, cradle to prison to death pipeline is alive and well in this country. And uh, I think it, it was the brother on the screen who mentioned uh, we need a pro a new abolitionist movement, or maybe it was Stuart. And, you know, mass incarceration is neo slavery, and that calls for neo abolitionism. And for me, that also starts with the children, whether it's their parents who are incarcerated or they themselves who are incarcerated. That the way that system is constructed is to purposefully criminalize and encage and enslave children so that they are a steady feed into the adult system. And unless we can uh, intervene and make sure that black, brown, black girls are being increase, increasingly uh, pushed out of school, all black children are being suspended, expelled, arrested, uh, abused, uh, harassed, bullied by law enforcement uh, within schools at alarming rates. And we know the interventions. We know how to intervene. We know how to give supports to people so that this doesn't happen. But we don't have the political will to do that because, as other people have mentioned, you can't try to reform a system that has been built since the taking of these lands from Native people on the backs of free labor extracted from black bodies, children, women, the production of black bodies. This has been, this is what our country is based on. So there are reforms, there are things we can do in terms of providing, uh, you know, sufficient resources for social and emotional development in schools that really treat, that, that are aimed at anti-trauma, uh, ways of treating trauma of children, getting police out of schools. When SROs, when cops are in schools, children are seven times more likely to go to prison. And where are the cops in schools? Are they in the wealthy white schools? No, they're not. They're in the poor black schools. Are there any schools in this country that are mixed black and white? Very few. Schools are more segregated now than they were in Brown versus 
Board of Education. And that's also directly related to our economic inequality in this country. It's a terrible system. There are reforms that have to go in right away, that have to go in yesterday, just to preserve lives. But really, in order for this to ever approach any kind of equity, we have to have a, a neo-abolitionist movement that will get rid of the capitalist, private prison industrial complex that is what is driving the continued enslavement of black and brown and LGBTQIA plus people in this country. All right, I'm going to open it up with two questions. Um, I'm gearing them towards certain panelists, but you can answer either question. It's fine. Um, the first question for Stuart, Lashonia, and, Dur and Daruba. No, actually, I'm going to do, just kidding, just kidding. I'm going to do this question for Stuart, Lashonia, and Karen. Um, you all make connections to different types of violence, child violence, um, childhood trauma, engendered violence, intergenerational incarceration, and the work that you do in the community. Tell us more about these types of violence, how they express themselves systemically and on the individual level around mass incarceration and criminalization, and what you're doing to change the narrative. And our second question for Danny and for Daruba, how do you both pull international perspectives and international organizing through civil society, government, community, into your work around freeing political prisoners? Okay, um, before I answer your question, can I please introduce my daughter? Thank you for coming. I think that's a really loaded question when you start talking about violence, and I almost want to like scan the room and see who like them. Who's in the room and who I'm airing my dirty laundry in front of, if I can be really honest, because for me, a lot of the violence that I experienced was, um, the direct violence that I experienced was um, inside my home and in my community and in the school um, where I was raised. Um, like I said, I was born in Ward 8, raised in Ward 8 um, here in D.C. That's one of the most underprivileged areas in the community where um, during the late 80s, early 90s, on the crack cocaine era, um, when things were pretty bad, DC was the murder capital. So violence was like a very prevalent, I guess you could say, um, part of my life um, in my community and in my family. Um, for me, I think it's important that we as a community start um, looking at some of our cultural values as it relates to violence. I also think that we need to redefine violence. Um, we know that half of the people in prison now are in prison on violent crimes, and if we're really going to end or reduce mass incarceration, we have to rethink um, what is violence, um, what causes violence. Um, for me, violence is um, poor education, um, poor health care, um, unsafe environments, you know, um, childhood abuse, uh, molestation, all of these things is what has fed the rising the population for women in prison, um, poor health care, lack of education, um, childhood trauma, all of that stuff is violent too. So for me, that's a really loaded question to ask. Like the work I'm doing around violence to me is, you know, the changing my life, transforming my life. Um, I was a violent offender um, as a result of violent circumstances that I lived under. So the work, the way I'm working to um, address, um, you said systemic violence is through um, being the best person I can be in my community and my family um, by trying to um, help change some of these um, systemic um, policies and laws and institutions that are waging violence against my people, whether it be health care or education or mass incarceration. I hope I answered your question. I mean, that's a big question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I try. No, but thank you for being yeah. respected. Can I have one of the gentlemen, if you would like to Chime in. Uh, well, uh, I think I was dealing mostly with, with the domestic and uh, the things of mass incarceration and intersectionality. And you wanted Danny and I to talk about perhaps the um, interconnection on the international level. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I think it's appropriate for me to jump in with that now? Yeah. Or should we continue along yeah. the line to throw the I want to hear what you have to say and we can weave it all in because it's all interconnected. Okay, it's just, 
what you do. So first of all, I think everyone on this panel and most of the people watching knows that the United States is an empire in denial. And as an empire, it, uh, it has uh, intervened, uh, changed the paradigms of power and relationships between peoples of various countries and nations around the world. One of the foremost uh, uh, purveyors of violence, of course, in the world that the United States supports is the racist apartheid European Southern State of Israel. And uh, I have just recently been in communications with them. I had returned from Turkey a few months ago uh, with, with people from the Palestinian uh, liberation uh, struggle, the Palestinian movement. And we know there are hundreds and hundreds of, of political prisoners and political detainees in the occupied territories in, in, in Palestine, in Israel. And, uh, and Israel is the foremost, is the foremost uh, uh, recipient of U.S. foreign aid, military assistance, and technological assistance. So the U.S., the United States government, and our taxpayer money underwent the occupation and the brutality of, of, of the Israelis' occupation of Palestine. And um, this doesn't stop there. The United States is using its geopolitical power further and further and closer and closer to, to the to the former Soviet Union, contrary to agreements that it had uh, with the uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, that they would not advance NATO to the borders of, of, of Russia, has created a, a, a of, of struggle and, and, and war and civil war and, and, and disruption um, in the Balkans, in the in Eastern Europe, that has affected uh, 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 the European Union and its members um, in terms of dealing with the, uh, the, the fallout, the human, the human plots of, from these struggles that the United States has been behind. So we really need to understand that in the case of, for instance, of, of Israel, the United States and Israel has dual citizenship uh, 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 protocols, and many of the uh, many of the individuals who served in the uh, Israeli Defense Force, the IDF, also are, are police officers in the United States. Now, they go on leave, they work closely with law enforcement. Um, Israeli Mossad and Israeli and Shin Beth works closely with U.S. law enforcement. New York City Police Department has a, has a bureau headquarters in Tel Aviv. And um, so we need to understand that the United States as the empire has fostered this idea and this as state policy, as a policy to repress and suppress people of, of, of minorities and, and people who dissent from their policies is widespread, it's global. It's part of the European nation state concept, <coughs> national security state that we are, are, are struggling with today is the personification of these things that we're talking about here. Um, when the sister talks about <clears throat> uh, uh, the violence of, of how education, miseducation is an act of violence, how, um, how depriving a family, how depriving a family of livelihood and food and homelessness are all acts of violence are perpetrated by the state and by its agents. And so we should not look at violence solely as something that occurs because because a person has a gun or a knife and he attacks them. <laughs> oh, we, we can't hear you. Some that. No, no. No, no. no we, we were all agreeing that you were saying what we wanted to say, and then after that, we couldn't hear you. So we're not sure what you said oh, after you said it's all a part of the violence. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to say that, that, that the U.S. is an empire, uh, both domestically and uh, internationally has fostered the concepts and the anti-democratic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, attitude that all of the citizens of the nation are potential criminals, that everybody is a potential terrorist, mm -hmm. and that therefore we need militarized policing, we need uh, 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 get tough immigration laws to, 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 uh, to, uh, to keep certain people out of the United States, to uh, deport and uh, uh, other people who are in the United States without um, uh, uh, papers, that this whole atmosphere, this right-wing trend that we're dealing with at this particular historical moment, with the rise of Trump and, 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 and the right, 
is 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 reflective around the world. That's that's my point. That is happening in Germany. It's happening in France. It's happening in, in in Italy. It's happening in Greece. It's happening all over the world. That that the right wing, the fascist power, the connections between corporatism and the police state are becoming regularized and and accepted. And I think that we're fight, trying to fight this on a very limited level where we try to just deal with mass incarceration as a feature of US as a feature of US corporate capitalism. That we have to understand mass incarceration as a feature of the national security state as it's presently constituted. And that's the point I wanted to make. Thank you. I mean that was a good point. You brought it all together. Um Danny? Do you have something you would like to add to that? I know you, you're doing a lot of work well, around political I, prisoners and you're real international. You've been jumping around even just this week. Well, uh, one of the things, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how much I can add to uh, what, what, what Ruba said, but um, the, the work, you know, the historical violence uh, from the first um, settlements here um, have, has not only been violence to the to to those people violence to the murder of the birth as well the planet itself uh the extraction of resources the extraction of human labor uh, i've had the fortune of, of working uh with the mass campaign uh, for uh 11 years uh with with the cuban five uh, five men who were unjustly in prison for uh, for espionage, <coughs> they were simply attempting to uh, to get information which they were provided to law enforcement agencies here in the United States about terror <coughs> attacks on on uh, the Cuban soil, on the Cuban mainline, by operatives, uh, ma mafia operatives in Miami. They've been in prison for that the long term since of the time. Uh, one of them that I visited. Uh, repeatedly, many times in Victorville prison, was Geraldo uh, uh, Gonzalez, uh, Geraldo Hernandez, excuse me, Geraldo Hernandez. And, and, and I was able to kind of, to, in a sense, the effort needed to, to mobilize, see the mobilization of that, you know, the Cubans did not compromise with the opening uh, created by President Obama, those five political prisons were released, uh, I was also had the opportunity to be involved in the anti-apartheid movement uh, in the late in the seventies through African Liberation Support Committee. People remember African Liberation Support Committee in the mid, the early mid seventies, and in the attempt to end Portuguese colonialism and the, the struggle for the independence of Namibia, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, and South Africa. So there, there is uh, this, this. Obvious, this, this, it obviously, this work that continues to, needs to be done, which reflects not only, as my brother said, the issue around Palestine, you know, and, and the Palestinian people. Often, Palestinian people aren't included within the discourse of the violence that has happened to them, even though it's reported on, on various alternative outlet, out, out, outlets and, and collectively. So, it never reaches the point where it it it, it really uh, resonates within the public discourse, the public discourse to have change in, in policies. But we look at U.S. policy, and we look at U.S. policy from its outset: the annexation of Cuba, the annexation of the Philippines, the annexation of Puerto Rico. All those are part of, of U.S. expansionism, as it was before then. The annexation of lands that were part of Mexico. The history, the whole history of this country is one of annexation, you know, and it's also one of violence to the point. To the point. So where do we deal with that, that violence? I think Dr. King understood that, that violence when he talked about militarism and he talked about racism and he talked about materialism, you know. Others, other great men and women understood that violence. That we being divorced understood that violence from the point is the from souls of black folks from the beginning at the beginning of the 20th century. And on his, on his, on his 50th anniversary, wrote, it, it did not correct his analysis, but added to his analysis when he said, and I said, I'm not just 
just uh, not verbatim, but he said he said that what, what, what I still believe that the issue of the 20th century is the issue of color, but at, at the same time, and I'm paraphrasing, at the same time, I believe there's something else that I probably didn't understand, is that people, the, the few are willing to allow, to in order to maintain their privilege, mm -hmm. to allow those, the majority of people who look in ignorance and, and poverty, et cetera, and the way in which they do that is through war. And invariably, the issue, the people that, that who are the victims of that, that, that policy are people of color. If we look at every single war beyond World War II, it's been against people of color. You know, every single war that's occurred, every single invention has been against people of color. You know, something happened just a few, just within the last 10, 10 years in terms of Latin America. With Latin America, for the first time, through the, 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 the democratic process, people, ordinary people, went to the polls and said, we're going to let people who, who are going to look out for our interests, people from the left, you know, in a sense. And you begin to see the kind of remarkable things that were happening in places like Venezuela, where they addressed the issues of indigenous people, addressed the, 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 um, the, the, the violence against uh, the indigenous people, addressed the issues of women, addressed the issues even though it wasn't in the 1999 Constitution, address the issues around um, around Afro descendants as well. You know, there's another point in time for us to realize that the UN has designated this decade, to January 2015 to January uh, to December 2024, as the decade of the Afro descendant. How do we use that decade? How do we use that moment? And, 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 and now rectifying and also putting together political projects that deal with this issue, the issue about it, whether it's mass incarceration, whether it's political prisoners, whether it's health care, and all the other indices that, 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 that uh, indexes that which we are at the lower, the lower, lower realms of. Thank you. Again, we are talking about violence, systemic violence, U.S. empire, internationalism, pan-Africanism, and how that relates to the mass incarceration and criminalization of people of color, oppressed communities, and of course their social movements and their leaders. Oh, man. So, um, I was prepared to say a lot of stuff after LaShonda and then after Danny and Deruba um, pulled on all of the international uh, just as some stuff that, that actually speak volumes about violence, uh, I want to tell a brief little story. Um, one of the things that I do to address violence is that I take groups of young people, African American predominantly, um, uh, uh, ages between 13 and 18, and I take them away from the city. I take them out into the mountains to give them a different experience, to pull them away from the normal um, stuff that kind of reinforces the violent tendencies that they grow up with and becomes a part of them. And and so one of the things, the way that I do it is that I pretty much do it hand to mouth and, and I rely on people who see the work that I do to support the effort that I do. And so I'm on my way to St. Kofa on Georgia Avenue, and I have about three or four young guys in the car with me, and I'm driving this old beat-up green Avalon. And unfortunately, I mean, I would have done it had I been driving something else, but the window don't come down on the Avalon. So it's a great teaching moment because all of a sudden, the jump-outs get behind me and pull me over. And so I turn and I say, look, don't nobody move. Nobody turn around. I'm going to show you what you do when the police pull you over. But these are violent episodes that just normally should not take place because there's nothing, there's no reason for the car to have been pulled over. I didn't break any laws whatsoever. Why is it that the jump out decided to pull this little beat up old little car over? Because it's got relatively four or five black men in the car. That's the only reason for pulling this vehicle over. And so the justification for it after some back, because they want me to roll down a window that don't come roll down, so the kids are laughing because they know it don't roll down. <laughs> so, but, but I've done that even with a window that it don't come down. And so he was like, 
I see it, and he's got his hand on his gun, and they like all around the car. And 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 so that's a violent episode that our children go through daily. And when you go through that daily, it's like a saw. If you keep picking it, eventually you no longer feel the pain. You still it's still painful. It still hurts, but you no longer feel the pain. 